Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of Bronxnet or the program underwriters. Hey there, it is time for the Bronx Buzz. This is the program where we talk to Bronx journalists, Bronx photographers, in some cases editors, and uh, we try to get you inside what they're thinking and talking and uh, uh, considering when they do their uh, news stories that you end up reading and experiencing, whether it be through newspapers themselves or uh, online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this evening we have two great guests. One is kind of a two-for-one because he's a photographer and a writer, and the other's an editor. So we've got the whole expanse covered for you uh, this evening. Uh, my buddy, to, uh, my pleasure to welcome my buddy Julius Constantine Mogul. Nice to have you with us. Thanks for having Julius me back. Julius is with the award-winning Riverdale Press. There we go. And um, uh, Julius is kind of the two-in-one package that I was talking about because he's a photographer and also a journalist. So you'll see some of his photos about whatever it is on other people's work, as well as you will see photos that he takes as a photojournalist when he writes a story. Nice to have you with us again. Thank you for having me back. Talk to me a little bit about, um, just so people who are unfamiliar with your for work, sure. about your background. Were you a photographer first or a writer and journalist first? Both kind of at the <laughs> same time. <laughs> well, that really answers the yeah. question. Um, yeah. Give a little background about how you got started. And what yeah, for sure. I went to what was then known as the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism uh, for my master's. Yes, they just changed They the just name. changed the name to the Newmark Graduate right. School of Journalism. Right, 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 right. Uh, I graduated from there in 2014, uh, and shortly after graduating, I would moved to Istanbul, where I was for about two years. Um, so I got my start in foreign reporting, and for almost about the past year and a half, I've been the uh, photographer, the sole photographer for the Riverdale Press. Um, do you like doing one half more than the other? Like you say, gee, they sent me out to just take some pictures <laughs> in the event. I love that. Or do you say, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'd rather write the story. Or is it, again, that, that same perfect it's, balance? It's kind of a balance. I mean, since I'm solely, I'm mainly responsible for taking pictures for all the reporter stories, I have the benefit in between those assignments to kind of work on my own sort of long-form stories. Um, and that's, for me, some of the most rewarding stuff is being able to kind of take my time and dive deep and really kind of produce something, like, full. I have a terrible question, and you don't have to answer <laughs> it. <laughs> but, um, uh, again, I, I don't even know if you'll answer it, sure, but sure, it sure. is what occurred to me. So you're taking pictures at, a, at an event or at something that you're not writing the story. Right. Do you say to yourself, oh, I don't want to give this story to this, <laughs> this idiot? Or, you know, gee, I got an idea. Do you share ideas, uh, you know, as a journalist? Yeah, and, for and sure. And I know that it's all about teamwork in, in media for and the sure. Riverdale Press. I know you're working with people. That's why I thought it was a terrible question. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, no it's actually a good question because we're a real, <laughs> we're a lean team. It's four reporters and myself, essentially. And it's most often the case that I'm out with them in the field reporting and taking pictures. And I'm collaborating with them on questions as reporters interviewing, I'll chime in if I feel that something's not being asked, because I have, I have that training. Uh, and as I'm doing that, I'm also looking for what's the most visual aspect of whatever the assignment is. It, it really, um, from a journalist's point of view, mm -hmm. I'm sure makes your antenna go up, because while, and, and I know it from, frankly, sure. from both ends, not that I'm a photographer, but of course I've been a video journalist for a long time, that you, you see things and then you're concentrating on that yeah. or you're concentrating on the writing. I know for me, I do more writing yeah. than picture taking and I'm always concentrating. And then afterwards I say, oh, by the way, did I get visuals? Yeah. You probably got both wheels spinning. Yeah, I got both wheels spinning. I mean, it is, it is hard to do both at the same time, which is you know, why a lot of people specialize. You have people who are just writers, people right. who are just photographers. Um, but you know, as I'm taking pictures and I'm listening to things, uh, you know, sometimes I, I realize something and I'll you know, say to the reporter quietly, like, you know, maybe Check we should this ask out. this. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, now, now this story, um, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce it, um, this Ro Rohingya? Rohingya. Rohingya. Yeah. Um, now, 
We have some photographs because you are just a wonderful photographer. Yeah. Do we have photographs of this, or should we talk about this first and wait till that comes up? We can talk about this first. Okay. The photos I brought are So from, you yeah. received honorable mention uh, from the New York Press Awards for this story that you did in November. Of last year, yeah. Of last year. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so why don't you tell us all about this? So what had happened was, I think it was towards the end of August, uh, one of the reporters had mentioned that there was a small rally happening uh, by the monument in Riverdale uh, about the Rohingya crisis, trying to raise awareness. And I, I did what, what if many people might not know sure. what is the Rohingya crisis? Sure. So, I mean, it was a major international news item last year. The Rohingya are an ethnic Muslim minority uh, living in uh, Myanmar and following uh, what's been called an ethnic cleansing last summer. Hundreds of thousands of them have fled Myanmar for neighboring Bangladesh uh, seeking refuge. Um, so there was a small rally that was happening, and when I got there, there were only about like, like six to seven people, and I thought, I, it, there doesn't seem to be much here, just in terms of people who had shown up, but I thought, here's a real uh, opportunity to try to tell the story from a local angle, because in my, if, if I could have it, you know, fully my way, I, if I had the resources and the time, I would be in Bangladesh reporting out the story, like, on the front lines of the crisis, but sure. I'm here. So I figured, how can I tell that story over here and through the lens of the woman, this professor at Manhattan College who had organized the protest and has been really trying to raise awareness about it, it was through her lens that I was able to tell the story of the crisis through her perspective and I talked to now, a these, whole bunch of people. Are these her photos that are here? Uh, so the original photo from, well, we from the them. assignment is was that down here. That was the first rally. I see at the bottom. Um, of the page these two photos were generously provided by uh, BRAC USA, which is the U.S. outpost of this large or organization called BRAC, which is one of the largest NGOs operating in Bangladesh. Did, you know, I really want to get the time to sure. show some photos. But when you wrote it, did you say to yourself, you know what, this is a really good piece? Or did, were you like, oh my goodness, <laughs> honorable mention, how did, why did they choose this one? No, I, I mean, I definitely felt good about it uh, once I filed it and... Uh, when I filed it to my editor, he came back to me and said, I, I, I couldn't find anything to cut. Really? Yeah. So, so then you knew so you were I, I figured I'd probably... And, and we know Michael is tough as nails. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael Hinden, of course, we're talking about. All right, listen, I don't want to run out of time, and I want to show people these sure. beautiful, wonderful photographs. So we're going to do that. Um, we could talk forever about <laughs> even this one story. So here we go. Um, uh, Julius uh, Constantine Mogul from the Riverdale Press. Let's show some pictures. What do you got? What is this? Who is this? So this picture that's up right now is from a story we did uh, on the Lavelle School for the Blind. Okay. Uh, they had reached out. They do an art fair every year where their students, who goes without saying, are blind, create art pieces, right? So, you know, usually when you go to a gallery or a museum or whatever, it's, you know, there's distance between you and the art. You can't touch the art. But here it's all about touch. But here it's all about touch. And this photograph, you literally captured that, that the, here is a, a, a sight-impaired uh, youngster. Yep, who, uh, student is, at the school. As the whole idea is... The right. whole point is touching the art. All right, I, you know, I could spend a lifetime on a photo like that. Okay, well, but we got to move on. <laughs> so okay. what's the next picture? Let's see the next one. And this one. So this was from the student walkout uh, in March uh, uh, oh following right. the Parkland Massacre. This, right. These were Bronx science students uh, who had amassed in uh, Harris Field. Uh, and this is one of the kids with the megaphone. When you took this picture, were you aware, because I know a photographer wants to get good light, you want sure. to be on the other angle so you can yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah. Were you aware that you were getting something this dramatic, or was yeah. it one of those that you looked like this was a deliberate thing? This, I mean, it was, I mean, f for me visually, it was definitely deliberate. I mean, we also had the, I also had the benefit that day of like amazing light. Uh, in terms well, but of sometimes too much light is... is no, sure. Good. I mean, it could blow it out, but that, I don't know what happened that day, but I had no complaints. Wow. It, it, I mean, it tells the story. Again, photojournalism tells a story. Let's see what else you got. So this... Oh, wow, look at this. Yeah, so I, this... By the way, I have not seen any of these photos right. beforehand, so that's why I'm reacting viscerally to anything I see. So this was from a story a reporter and I uh, had worked on about the senior prom at the, I think it's called the Park Gardens um, Rehab and Nursing Center. Uh, and they essentially brought together... Uh, folks who were living there with incoming seniors at a local high school. And so it was like sort of a senior, senior prom. 
uh, but these were the prom king and queen from Park Gardens uh, who were dancing <laughs> together. Because, and they're both dressed in white, I guess, for different reasons. I guess so. Yeah, I'm not sure. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. All right, keep going. What do we got? So mm. th this was also from uh, the walkout day earlier this year, the same uh, story as the previous. Julia's playing with that lighting. <laughs> and this was as um, students were uh, uh, chanting and like reading down the list of names and talking about what the day was about. Um, and they were sort of like quietly, contemplatively listening. I, I ask many photographers this question, and I'm curious how you feel about it. When sure. you take them, yeah. are you, especially now, I guess it's a little easier because you have digital photography sure. and you can see it. Are you aware of how good the photo is or like you say, ooh, I got a good one? Or sometimes you go back and say, wow, I didn't realize it. That really turned out well. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I'm, I'm usually re reacting to like a gesture or a moment or a look or something. Um, uh, and I kind of compose around that. So, I mean, with this one, when I look on the back of the camera later, I'm like, I, all right, I think I got a good one. Um, but usually there are pictures that sometimes surprise me later that I didn't realize in the moment were good pictures. And, and before, because we're going to run through one or two more, yeah. um, uh, what, what equipment do you use? Uh, I use? You know, so many people right now, and frankly, I've seen it with journalists and news photographers, they're just using their cell phones. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's I, an incredible technology. But you, you, don't, you don't do that necessarily? No, I, there have been like maybe two or three occasions when I've used my phone, uh, but I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark IV and a 35 and an 85 lens. Mm. Um, okay, keep, keep going. Let's, let's, what was next? <laughs> so this... Uh, this is Gary trying to figure out how to use all that stuff. <laughs> This was a story, uh, she has uh, a, a condition, I think it's called familial dysautonomia. Uh, I was working with the reporter Zach Castro um, on this story, and so uh, she has trouble getting around, uh, but she had mentioned that she loves exercising. And uh, so we went, she lives up at Skyview, we went into the gym there, and she was just showing me stuff that I did not expect she could do do, mm -hmm. uh, including doing the leg lifts, and she was doing push-ups and pull-downs. It was kind and, of amazing to see. What makes it a remarkable photo, of course, is the fact that she's fully dressed doing them, but right. also her color. Um, obviously, I mean, I don't need to describe it. People can clearly see how the color affects the drama of the picture. And of course, uh, when you do a, sh a, shot, a shoot like that, you take, uh, is this the result of shooting 20 of them or 100 of them or five of them? Or was this like, wow, look at that, I got it. It depends on, I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of time with her, so it was, it was like less than 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm trying to work the scene as much as possible, but uh, this came as a result of fewer photos than right. more photos. We, we have one more picture? Do I, do I think I have, so. Was I counting one or right? two he's, more, he's yeah. Nice better than I. All right, let's see. Oh, yeah. what happened here? <laughs> Whoever was in the picture left. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the reporter, Zach Koster, and I were reporting on a murder that had happened. Oh, there's one more after this, go ahead. Uh, and it's, we were doing a second day story about two or three days after the incident had occurred, um, and we were finding it increasingly difficult to talk to people because clearly it's a sensitive situation and they're scared. Um, and so we managed to get into the building and we were like looking for sort of like clues, context clues, what had happened. And in the entryway, there was the mailboxes on the right, and Zach, the mailboxes on the left, and Zach was looking for like the number of the super or something, trying to find someone to talk to. And on the right, I saw this this handprint. Then, now, do we think that this was part, like something you know, that the, either the police got or they we missed? We couldn't get confirmation either way, uh -huh. um, but it it spoke to what had happened. I, I, you know what I happen to love about it, and they're telling me we got to wrap it up, and I do want to bring Patrick Rocchio over in the Bronx Times on, but. The, the, the smaller thing on the bottom left, I don't know if we can still get that. This thing, this looks like a footprint in and of itself. It's <laughs> almost like a handprint on top of a footprint. All right, we got one more, and then we're throwing Julius out of there. Thank you. What do we got? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do we got? One more, they told me? Oh. So there was a fire at the Greystone building uh, a mm. couple of months ago, and by the time we had arrived, it was, already, it was already out, and so we were trying to figure out, like, you know, what can we do? And so... I said to Zach, who's a reporter on the story, I said, let's just try to get in the building. And so we walked up to the apartment where the fire had started. No one was hurt, no one had died. Um, but I just, I looked in the front door 
and there was that box that, that burned out box mementos. that said mementos. Oh my goodness! And I said, "There's my picture." Julius, I really hope you work here in the Bronx for a very long time because it's a joy to see your work and Thank to you. read your work. And um, uh, <laughs> applause from all of us here. I, I, don't, I don't even know what, and, and getting me to a point where I don't know what to say, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, but, but thank you so much, and for thank sure. you for the great work. Uh, you'll thank come you. back and show us more. For sure. Uh, great pictures, a great uh, award-winning journalist, and, um, and, a, and a good guy, too. Thank, thank you, you so much. Constantine Modell from the Riverdale Press. We're going to take a break. We're going to be back. We're going to change gears. The assignment editor at the um, uh, Bronx Times and I will be moderating together a political forum this Sunday on City Island. We're going to get you inside what that's all about. Don't go away. Sure, I look cute now, but when my owner lost his job, it was rough. I was living on the street, and one night, me and this cocker spaniel got into it so bad, I wound up looking like an ice cream cone. I cried a little bit, but thankfully I got rescued, so I'm running, I'm jumping, all back to my old self. And I'm ready to give unconditional love, even if you put a lampshade on my head. It's not always easy being a dad. Do you have panda asthma too? Does that run in the family? This is the home of the most priceless kung fu artifacts. But when you make an effort... Dad, we're not supposed to touch anything. Oh, sorry. Go along, son. It's always worth it. Whoa, master! The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. I am gonna get you. I'm gonna get you. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. This is Tess from Vivo's Do It Your Selfie, where we recreate the hottest looks from today's biggest music videos. After cleaning out our closet, we have a lot of clothes we don't wear anymore. Like this old t-shirt. It's not garbage, it's actually a brand new rug. And to make it, all you need to do is cut, tie, and glue. Cut the t-shirt into strips. Tie the strips into knots. And glue the knots to the bath mat. I love it. Give your garbage another life. And recycle. All right, we've switched gears, and uh, now we're going to, well, they publish in the East Bronx, but they cover the whole Bronx. It's the Bronx Times, and our good friend uh, Patrick Rocchio, uh, the assignment editor, is with us. Uh, nice to have you with us, Patrick. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, you and I <laughs> have been yeah. thrown together uh, to moderate a, um, a forum between uh, the two candidates in the 34th Senatorial District, highly competitive between uh, incumbent Jeff Klein and Alessandra Biaggi who right. is the, the challenger, um, and that will be Sunday night at 8 o'clock at uh, the church on City Island. Grace Episcopal Church. Grace Episcopal Church. You are a City Island resident, which is Indeed. one reason why they wanted him, and they wanted me to just be quiet but be there because I've moderated all these political debates in the, in the past. Um, talk to me about the mood on City Island as regards this race. It's pretty contentious, and that's a place where there really are people on both sides of the political spectrum. I think I think you're going to see a lot of uh, variety in terms of the uh, in terms of the folks out there, and a lot will lean towards Jeff. A lot will lean towards Alessandra. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, you know, there's an activist Democratic community out there, um, and there's also a conservative um, right, uh, you right. Know, established community. Right. And you know, I, I mentioned this on the show. For someone to defeat Jeff Klein, he's got a lot of friends, in, uh, certainly in the East Bronx and many places, because he's done work for them. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. He definitely works his district. I mean, you know, there, right now, you know, we have this year, this big year, where a lot of uh, uh, female candidates are getting elected. It's, um, you know, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, an un a very unusual year for the Bronx, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly with Joe Crowley and Alison, uh, you know, Alex Alexandria, Alexandria <laughs> you know, Cortez, and yeah. uh, 
it's a, it's a very unusual year. Um, you know, I talked to, let's see, we, last week we had David Cruz and we also had uh, Michael Hinman, um, David from the Norwood News and Michael from the Riverdale Press talking about the debate that we did mm -hmm. um, on BronxNet television, which you can still catch, by the way. Just go to our website. You can, you can pick it up. They're also still showing it uh, periodically online. Um, what were your impressions of that uh, debate? Because you were in the room, Bronx Times was a um, one of the sponsors. Right. Right? I thought it went very well. I thought you did a great job. And, uh, That's not why I asked, by the way. You, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of tension between, between both of these candidates. It mm -hmm. is clear. It's very, very tense. You know, there's been a lot of back and forth with um, one of the, you know, one of the candidates' camps um, on, on this debate and, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean... Uh, in, in other words, on the forum that's coming up. Uh, yeah, just the just the ju just the format, the ground rules, et cetera. So, so it's very contentious. See, when, and, and, and I'll tell you because I've, I've you know been part of it. Obviously, um, not obviously, but many people know that, that that was the 64th debate that I moderated, and the, the one we did last week. It's was impressive, Gary. I, I, we try not to count, but when you get to 65 debates, it starts to be a lot. It's um, uh, so we have kind of a system of rules and how we handle it, and it works out generally pretty well. I mean, every now and then we have to deal with it. But when you have a forum in the neighborhood, right. and we're, that's where, because everybody wants to have in on it, you know. Right, right. Um, what do you anticipate? I mean, we don't know, I don't know who's going to win. Or, or give me your thoughts in what you and I need to do to present it so that we do our job of presenting kind of a, a fair informational forum. Well, I was, I was just taking a look at some of the uh, questions. Some suggested of the questions. Suggested questions. We're going to work on them together over the weekend. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, you know, obviously the IDC, healthcare, you know, the Medicare for all uh, healthcare bill. Um, a lot of the things that are in, in you know, in New York State, um, and uh, a lot of the issues, I mean, in New York State, and it's it's. Uh, uh, I'd like to put in some local issues as well, you know, I, the I city on traffic. I, I wanted to ask you about that. As a city island resident, I mean, stepping back from your role as a journalist yeah. and even being involved in this, yeah. are there issues that you would like to see them address that particularly uh, pertain to city island? I know what I, I, I mean, the traffic is still a, an immense issue as far as I'm concerned, and, and certainly weekends and all that. Um, but there's development issues and all that. What, what, what's on your mind? That's I mean, I, mind. I mean, I would say I, I would I would say the, the, those state issues are definitely on my mind. But uh, as well as local issues like the, um, you know, working with the businesses to to reduce traffic and the police to reduce traffic. Maybe, maybe not the number of cars, but increase the flow, make it work better. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly on, on my mind. You mentioned development. Yeah, I mean, there are some projects that I think a lot of City Islanders are for. So I don't know if development's really that big of an issue, but uh, it, 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 there are also some people who are not too happy about that. But mm -hmm. well, and empty storefronts. I mean, empty storefronts, empty business storefront. development. And, and there's a real balance there, because if you put more stuff in there, you're going to get, and we want business, and you want to have more, but then you're going to bring in more cars. Right. I mean, this was the right. balance. I was, as you know, involved in that via Community Day when, you know, they really tried to sp spruce up downtown City Island. Um, and there is that balance. You say, well, wait a minute. We've got some empty stores. We want to fill them up. We want to make it a destination for people. On the other hand, we don't want all these people here. We can't move around. You know? Right. It, you know, it's a delicate balance you got to strike. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're looking forward to it? Um, yeah, with you dread? know, <laughs> with a little bit of dread, you know, after, after, after all of the back and forth and not so much with the committee hosting it, but with, you know, one of the candidates, uh, I really wish, uh, I really wish people could, would just get in there, debate, and then be done with it. My goal and my goal when we do it on television and my goal for Sunday night is always the same. Number one, give people a chance to hear what the candidates have to say. That, that is what I'm always thinking about so that they can make a, 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 an informed decision. That's really what it's about. Um, and, and the same thing applies here. What I also would like, and you mentioned it, health care. What are you going to do to address the health care issues? What are you going to do? And let people just see that. If we can get to that, 
I think we'll have done a, you know, a good job. We're going to try. <laughs> We're, we are definitely going to try. Uh, <laughs> oh, I hope my neighbors are happy with me afterwards. That's uh, well, all I can that's say. That's right. You got I can go to the other side. Yeah, of the you can. You, you, you can go home, and I got to. <laughs> I got to live with them. <laughs> um, you were uh, changing gears here. You yeah. um, attended the launch of the uh, the new um, Soundview ferry. I was on the maiden voyage. You were on the maiden voyage. Um, all reports that I've heard and seen are that this has been a um, uh, this is really a good innovation and something good for the Bronx. Oh, it is it is marvelous. It really? is marvelous. I mean, uh, getting to Wall Street in forty five minutes. Or for, uh, let's just interject. For people from Soundview, what would they have to do? They take a bus to I a train? Don't, I don't know, I don't know uh, how would take you do the it. Six, which is a local, and then try and switch downtown to get an express. You're looking at, at uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Sure, boy. sure, sure. The only thing faster is a helicopter. Yeah, we, we don't have those <laughs> just yet. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the views are amazing. And uh, the. I think if, if there are more things like this, like those four Metro North stations that are supposed to come to the Bronx, like um, other transportation options, uh, this area uh, of the eastern part East of the Bronx. Bronx could really, could really grow and become a much more um, vibrant place because I think people want to get into Manhattan to get to those jobs. They want to get into Manhattan for entertainment. You know, I think, and, and this comes up in the dialogue, and we've, we've had it on this show and on, on, on Bronx Talk as well, the, the dialogue about NYCHA. So you say, well, look, we know that, you know, there are all these the lead paint and the, the, there's water cascading as we speak down, uh, down in, in Morrisania. I mean, it's completely inexcusable. But the human cost to those things, and just maybe to a lesser degree, but the human cost of people who want to be successful to get down to Wall Street and, and achieve in the financial area, and you're asking them an hour and 15 minutes by subway, and, and they're burdened, and, and on a summer day they're hot, and on a winter day they're cold, or they're sitting on the subway with a winter coat on. That takes its toll from people being productive and, right, and being right, successful. Right. And, and so I think it's, you can't measure it, but I agree with, with your premise. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I think people, um, you know, if you know if they have access, very quick access to Wall Street or to Midtown or to the Upper East Side, they can get to new opportunities uh, much easier. Is there there's one boat that goes back and forth, or are there a couple that? that I think it's I th I, th I think it's I think right now it's one. I'm not I'm not I'm not sure about that. Don't quote me All on right. that. All right, <laughs> don't quote you. You're on TV. <laughs> That's it. He was quoted. Uh, Patrick, um, I'm looking forward to being with you Sunday right. night. We're going to do a great job. We're going to be fair right. to the people in the Bronx. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking to being fair to everybody. That's it. Okay. Uh, Patrick Rocchio from uh, the Bronx Times Reporter. Pick it up. Look at it online. Read it. Do your thing. And uh, thanks to um, Julius from the Riverdale Press. Uh, thanks to our great crew in here. And thanks to you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, Monday night, by the way, we're doing my 66th debate. And it will be for the open seat in the 87th Assembly District. Three new candidates that you probably haven't seen. That will be on Bronx Talk Monday night. Good night.